Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. Our scripture lesson today is from the second chapter of 2 Kings, verses 1 through 15. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elijah and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elijah replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elijah and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elijah had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elijah, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elijah replied. You ask for a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elijah then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. And the company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elijah. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in this passage, this is one that is uh, shared at annual conference each year as an elder of the church who is retiring takes a mantle off of their shoulders and places it onto the, onto the shoulders of an ordinan about to be ordained an elder of the church. We practiced that practice for many years, and I don't know how the retirees make their selection. The, the, uh, my elder class, when we uh, were about to be ordained, we chose by lots who would be the one to uh, receive the mantle. It is also kind of an interesting statistic. Apparently, a number of the ones who have received the mantle didn't last in ministry real long, or at least not in the United Methodist Church. Some went on to other denominations. But this story is a, is a pivotal story in which we, we see mentor and mentee. We see the coach and the coachee, the one who, who is being prepared for ministry to take Elijah's place, Elijah, as he travels about with him, learning everything that he can learn, assisting him however he can assist. And even in this, as the story unfolds, we hear Elijah look at Elijah and say, stay here, just wait. Oh no, I'll go with you. As long as you're alive, as long as our God is a living God, I will continue to go with you from place to place. We're told in the story that Elijah knew that the death of his master was coming. And truthfully, I think Elijah knew it too. 
And as it turns out, every village that they went to, the prophets there knew it as well. It was common knowledge. They knew this was the day. And so we get to hear that interchange. Do you know? Yes, I know. Be quiet. Be quiet. And he continues on through the journey until that moment in which finally Elijah, knowing that the end is near, asks him what he can do for him. What is, what is the final blessing that he may give to Elijah? And Elijah asks for a double share of God's Spirit that's upon Elijah to be upon Elijah. Elijah recognized that that, Elijah recognized that that was not something that he could just automatically grant to Elijah, that that would be ultimately up to God, but gave him the signs by which he would know if that was the will of God. And so we see it unfold. This is an act of discipleship. Over these last couple of years, you've been hearing me talk quite a bit about discipleship, and I've got news for you. You're going to continue to be hearing quite a bit about discipleship from me in the years to come. I, I will say that in some ways that is a change in my ministry. It's a change in a lot of our pastors' ministry because we, we went through kind of about a 100-year period in which we, we saw the work of the church of discipleship being something that we, we tended to place in the hands of Sunday school only. But we didn't even call it that. We'd, we'd call it Christian education. It tended to be more about receiving information and learning that way, but not about transformation. Not about as much to the question of, what does this mean for me? How does this change my life? It's really only been over the last couple of decades that that major shift has really begun to get focused because what we've come to realize is that for a while, we were living in that age in which you simply build the church, open the doors, and they come. Truthfully, that age has been gone since about the 1950s. I guess it's time for that door to close. It's windy outside. We came into the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, and, and frankly, all organized institutions began to be under scrutiny and questioned the validity of, of who they are and what they are. Now, this was a part of, part of what came out of that movement of the 60s that really questioned everything of authority. So not just the church, the government, other institutions as well. And it suddenly it was no longer something that if you wanted to be somebody in your community, you ought to show up in church. That no longer was, is that important. And so it's meant dwindling numbers across the years. And we've suddenly realized that build it and they will come doesn't work. The truth is, is that we are always one generation away from Christianity coming to an end. The continuation of Christianity depends upon those who are currently Christians to continue to spread the good news, to share the love of God, to mentor others in the faith, to disciple them, to, as Jesus said, go and make disciples. And when we fail to do that, we fail the passing of the mantle to the next generation. Today, as uh, we spend some time on, on discipleship, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the phases of discipleship. First one I want to look at is, is this diagram that talks about life stages. It's a good way to understand discipleship if we look at human development first. Uh, the first one I'm getting back in touch with right now, as you know, is a grand, brand new grandfather. You know, infancy. 
when you think about infancy, when you think about this stage of development, the child can do nothing for themselves. I, I think about our conversations with my son this, this past two weeks and, and daughter-in-law, and it's, you know, it's changing the baby's diaper, it's feeding the baby, it's making sure that the baby is adequately clothed to keep, keep warm enough or, or not get too warm. Uh, literally everything has to be done for the child. She cannot bathe herself. She cannot do anything by herself. She is an infant. And she needs care. But as she grows older, she moves into childhood. What are some of those things that, that begin to mark the difference between an infant and a child? Potty training. Potty training. Yeah. Figure out how to take care of the, take care of the body necessary functions themselves. What else? Learning to be more independent. Even before they can get to that, what else did they learn? To say no, to ask why. How many of you have gotten to hear that question? Why? And then we hear those terrible words come out of our own mouth, because I said so. Learn to walk, learn to talk, even before walking, perhaps crawling, climbing. So it's all of that, that exploration that, that the child is beginning to do as they, that really is what marks them different from infancy to childhood, is now they are beginning to do some of their own exploration. But are they ready to be completely independent? No. They still need guidance. They still need some, uh, some additional help from others. Oh, yeah, they may be able to get dressed, but somehow the shoe ends up on the wrong foot, doesn't it? Uh, when they get older, it won't fit that way anymore, but they might get away with it a little bit at that age. Or, or they get their clothes on backwards. Well, some of us may never get completely over that one. But, you know, it, it, it's just there's more, there's still some more assistance that's yet needed to, to help them out. They learn to feed themselves. They begin to figure out how to manipulate a fork and a knife and a spoon and to be able to do those things. Again, they may still need somebody to help them cut their meat. Maybe that's not quite something they've mastered yet. As, as, they, as, we, as we continue to think about those stages of growth, you know, we begin, the child grows a little bit older and gets a little more experienced and eventually becomes into those, those terrible years known as teenage years, adolescence. All the hormones start raging. And now they don't think they need mom and dad anymore. They are independent. I can do it myself. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. I want to go do this. Independence begins to mark that more and more. And, and truthfully, we know as adults, we need to let them start having some of that independence. That it's, that it's a normal part of that growth process. And, and yet we still have to be kind of somewhere near that when they fall and fail, that we can pick them back up, help them back get back to their feet and say, it's okay. And they move on and they learn and they grow. The last stage on this chart, that of, of adulthood, is it's, it's really inaccurate that in any of these drawings I've ever seen, we kind of just group the rest of your life into that one big category. Because the truth is, is that those stages of development continue on. When we think about it, we do not expect the same things from our 20-year-old that we do from our 30-year-old. Nor do we expect the same things from a 40-year-old that we expect from a 30-year-old. Nor do we expect the same things from a 70-year-old that we would from somebody even older than that. You know, each age has its continued development that's happening, and there reaches a point where it seems like we start going backwards, doesn't it? that suddenly we're starting to need help again, that we can't do it by ourselves, that maybe we don't have the vision that we need to have 
uh, that we aren't able to drive ourselves, that we uh, aren't able to, to lift the things that we lifted before or, or to, to do the things that we did before. The mind isn't, isn't perhaps quite as sharp. Oh, it may still be there, but it doesn't react as quickly. Uh, and so that, that causes us to begin to, to need a little bit of assistance again. And yet, when I think about folks that are in their 80s and 90s, while as a society we have a tendency to want to stick them into a nursing home, to store them there, if you will, the truth is, is that if we think about it, I think that's where we can learn a lot from, for instance, from Native American culture and a number of other cultures that look at our 80 and 90 year olds with great reverence. That these are persons who have lived a long, healthy life, that have much wisdom that they've gained from that life. Oh, that doesn't mean that they lived it perfectly. That doesn't mean that they did everything right. We can learn as much from the, the lessons of what went wrong and what didn't work as we can from the things that were right on the money and just, just the right thing to do. I think about when Ron was a teenager, Lois and I would oftentimes tell him some very truthful, honest things about things we had done in our lives. And the thing I said to Ron over and over again learn from our mistakes. Go make your own unique mistakes of your own. You don't need to repeat the mistakes that we made. That's the nature of growing up. And as we think about that, we can take all of this about our human development and we can translate that into thinking about it in terms of discipleship. That in discipleship, there is a point where we begin as infants not about age, but about our experience as a Christian. And that we need people to care for us and to walk us through. Even, even as we think about, about before that experience, and in essence, to use the human development, think about the conception stage. Uh, in discipleship, we would talk about that as being uh, the stage in which we are searching for meaning. In the 17th chapter of Acts, verses 16 to 34, is the story where Paul is in Athens. He's at the Areopagus. And there at the Areopagus, there are, are lots of statues to various gods. And as Paul is walking around, he finds an inscription that he decides is the exact one that he needs to pick on. And so when it's his opportunity to speak in front of the crowd, he says, I, I see this inscription over here that says to an unknown God. And now he's got their attention. He says, I want to tell you about that unknown God. And uses that as his launching point to talk about the ministry and life of Jesus Christ and how God sent Christ here for us. And that because of his resurrection, we have power and we have life. And Paul used that moment to begin to discipleship people in even that pre-knowing Christ Christianity was a choice. You see, everyone is seeking to make sense of our lives. From the very beginning of our lives, we are seeking to make sense. We want to learn what our purpose is. We want to learn how, we, how and why we're here, why, why we're to do what we're to do, what gives us joy, what gives us fulfillment. And we explore many different sources to figure that out. That's, that's not even an unusual one in our, in our young years, but even into our teen years, older teen years. Think about the number of, of kids who graduate from high school and they get out of the house, they go to college or they go into the military or go out on their own and it becomes a time of exploration. They try drugs, they try alcohol, they try sex, they try all kinds of different things, seeking to find fulfillment, seeking to try to find their purpose in life. Why are they here? And at some point, perhaps someone in the right moment introduces them to that unknown God. And so they come to the church and want to explore first chapter of John, verses 43 to 51, we hear the story of 
of Jesus as he calls Philip to be a disciple. And then Philip goes and finds his brother Nathaniel. And all excited looks at Nathaniel and said, I've found him. I've found the Messiah. I've found the one we've been waiting for. Come and see. And so Nathaniel comes and encounters Jesus and ultimately ends up with his own invitation to come and follow me. It's what the exploring Christ's way is all about, is, is, is that explorers, explorers may, may come to attend church wanting to belong, but they, they still haven't gotten to the point of following Jesus. They, they hear the invitation, perhaps, but they still haven't quite made it their own. It's a time of, of intellectual wrestling. It's a, a time in which they're trying to figure out what God's presence means in their life. It's a time that they may be, be filled with caution more so than curiosity. But as they continue in that journey, the goal of those of us around that are seeking to disciple them it needs to be to help them to reach that moment in which they now accept Jesus for themselves. And that is the point where they have moved now to the beginning stage and beginning a new life in Christ. This is, in essence, they've just now moved from infancy to childhood. It's really all the further they've moved. They still need some assistance, but they now are starting to see some things for themselves, and they want it in in their lives. Uh, Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 24 to 27, shares the story of the wise man who built his house upon the rock, uh, as compared to the one who built his house upon the sand. And we know what happens when the storm comes along, the one who built his house upon the sand, the house goes tumbling down but the one who built his house upon the rock. And that's what the beginning of the new life in Christ is about, is, is, is helping them to build their house upon the rock. Beginners are the largest group in most churches. They are beginning to put the pieces together to figure out how to, to put their faith into practice on a daily basis. It's also a time in which they are very vulnerable, a time in which they are insecure. It's a time in which they, they have doubt. And so they need to be involved in in small groups, in settings where they can receive encouragement and guidance from others who are on that journey with them and and ahead of them on that journey so that they may may learn and and continue to grow. And as they continue in that that growth pattern, they move into growing our walk in Christ. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16 is a teaching by Paul about unity and maturity in the body of Christ. In the 14th verse he shares, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Oftentimes it's at this stage in which, in which persons are much more willing to begin to let their faith become something of public knowledge. They begin to take responsibility for their their own maturing relationship with with Christ. They are, in essence, in that adolescent years in which they are now. They they still need somebody nearby, but but they're much more able to begin to do things on their own to figure out what this relationship is all about. They begin to invest their own time and their, their own energy to grow. And in this stage... This is the stage where we seek to live our faith in everyday life, looking to Jesus as the source of our life, looking to Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of the pathway upon which we find ourselves. And finally, we reach that point where we are maturing all our life in Christ. This is adulthood. But remember what I said about adulthood. It's still growing. That's why the word is maturing, not matured. Most of us will never be mature in the faith. We're still maturing. We're still learning. We're still, still growing and, and, and figuring out new, new things and new possibilities and, and how to integrate faith into yet other areas of our life that we had maybe not quite thought of yet. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20, 
He shares, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. People who are at this stage of the journey have surrendered their life to God. They give total control of their life to Jesus. They lay down their lives daily to serve Jesus. And they are now the ones who are helping to mentor those who are younger in the faith that are still learning. We can take this diagram with these, these five parts of, of our, our phases of discipleship and, and look at it through a Wesleyan lens as John Wesley would think about the presence of God's grace. And what we, we discover as we look at that is that in the searching and the exploring stage, it is God's prevenient grace that is going ahead of us and working with us. Even before we know God exists, God is already seeking to draw us in and God is seeking to draw us into yet a deeper relationship and to enter into relationship. The beginning new life in Christ is that point in which we are saying, yes, God, yes, Jesus, I want to do this. It is that justifying moment in which we come fully into relationship, into the righteousness of, of God. And then from there, the growing and the maturing stages are the sanctifying grace part of the journey where God is continually to un continuing to unfold his love in our life to help us see those other corners of the room yet that we've not yet cleaned and given to God. To open the doors of those closets that we would wish nobody would ever look in and to make them available to God to help us clean out. The other diagram that I, I really like that I think is helpful to understand is, is this one where, where we see the, the four parts that it fit the church, exploring, beginning, growing, and maturing in the circle. We start on the upper right quadrant in the exploring stage. It is a less structured stage. It is one that is discipler led. That is, it means that there's somebody else exterior to us that's in our life at that point that's helping us to through personal relationships to begin to explore and see, uh, to answer the question, why? Why should I become a disciple of Jesus? As we begin to get that question answered and, and, and begin to, to move into this relationship, we move into the beginning stage where mentors are still an important part of our, class, of our, of our upbringing, of our, of our growth, but likewise, we need to be in classes in small group settings that help us to begin to answer the question, what do I have to do? It's a much more structured time. And as we continue through that process, we slide into the growing stage. There, groups are still a part of us. Uh, we are still in this time of, of structured environment, but now we are beginning to take more responsibility for ourselves. It's no longer discipler-led, it's now disciple-led. It's now self-led that we begin to work through how do I live my faith fully into this? And as we, as we get that, that question answered, then we move finally into that maturing stage. What if I surrender completely? My fear is, is that too often that we, we never get to that point where we begin to really ask, what if? How would my life change if I were willing to just give this completely over to God and see what happens. This is the journey of discipleship. This is the phases that all of us go through. And, and, and you've heard me talk before about the different dimensions of, of discipleship. We're, we're not going to be at the same point of all of these in every, every aspect of our life of discipleship. There may be some areas that we are ready to give completely over to God, but other areas that we're not that we're still asking the what questions or, or maybe even the how and the why questions before that. Um, you know, we're, we're just sorting that all out. We are invited by Christ to enter into relationship. We're invited by Christ to grow in that relationship. 
God loves us so much that we are not left where we started. If we were, we would be left as infants, still needing to drink spiritual milk, but not ready for the meat yet, not ready for the potatoes and the carrots of faith, not ready to really take on the fullness of what it means to be Christ's disciples. But each step we take, each growth moment that we experience, we move closer and closer to that, that we may become the maturing Christ follower that we are invited to be. And that's my invitation and my hope for each of you, that you will continue on this journey and grow in your discipleship that each day as you go to bed, you may look back upon that day and see that in some way, perhaps you are more like Jesus this day than you were the day before. And that that be your goal for the next day that the next day you be more like Christ than you were today.